What have been the consequences of the Industrial Revolution for the environment? This is a question that I will deal with. Since the start of the Industrial Revolution, the human population and production have grown enormously. By now, the human world population is more than 10 times as large as in the mid 18th century. Production growth was slow at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution and accelerated later, especially after the Second World War. In the 20th century, industrial production increased by about a factor of 40. So did the catch of fish, their sales of vessels were replaced by fossil fuels and fishing technology was strongly influenced by industrial developments. The developments since the start of the Industrial Revolution have had and have a large impact on the environment. That is natural resources, living nature and the levels of pollutants. And natural resources may be defined as items from nature that humans take or use as inputs in the economy. Examples thereof are fresh water, wood, fertile soils, also fuels and ores. It's not that humans before the Industrial Revolution have had no large impacts on their environments. After their entry in Australia, Aboriginal hunter-gatherers drastically changed living nature by hunting and by burning vegetation. Lead originating in the emissions of Roman lead smelting about 2000 years ago can still be found in the glaciers of Greenland. Between 1000 and 500 years ago, the Netherlands lost much land to the sea because of over exploitation of peat soils. And this was before the Industrial Revolution. But the impact of the Industrial Revolution on the environment is larger than earlier impacts of hunter-gatherers, early cities and farmers. In the 19th century, environmental impacts of the Industrial Revolution on the environment came to be noted. The economist William Stanley Jevons, living in the United Kingdom, wrote a book, The Coal Question. This dealt with the coming depletion of coal in the United Kingdom and also looked into the mechanisms behind the use of coal. Professor Wilterdink already referred to the steam engine. Jevons noted that when steam engines, major consumers of coal, became more efficient, they didn't lead to a decrease in the overall use of coal. By now, this effect is known as the rebound effect. 19th century authors on both sides of the Atlantic lamented the loss of living nature. And in the vicinity of Manchester, the deposition of acids and its negative effects were noted. As a rough approximation to the impact of the Industrial Revolution on the environment, the following formula has been proposed. This formula is known as the IPAD formula. I is P times A times T, in which I stands for environmental impact, P for population, A for affluence, and T for technology factor. In this slide you will see the development of the number of humans since the mid 18th century. And the numbers are up. The next slide shows the development of affluence, gross national product per capita, in constant dollars in the distant and in the more recent past. The numbers are up. The technology factor refers to characteristics of technologies used. And this is a variable factor. For instance, since the 19th century, the average per capita travel time per day has not changed. It's still about 75 minutes. But whereas feet dominated travel in the 19th century, in industrialized countries, currently cars dominate. Cars are much more of an environmental burden than feet. On the other hand, per kilowatt hour, 
the environmental burden of silicon-based photovoltaic cells is much less than the burden of power production by using coal. The difference may be about a factor of 10. In industrial countries, protein from beans may well be about a factor of 7 better to the environment than average meat protein. Overall, the net burden of mankind on the environment, this is the I in the IBIT formula, has much increased since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and this has consequences. One aspect of is the depletion of natural resources. Slide 4 gives two examples thereof. Coal production in the United Kingdom peaked in 1913, and the production of conventional oil in the United States peaked in 1971. The next slide shows current water scarcity, which is partly linked with the depletion of fresh water resources by human activities. Another aspect of the environmental burden is the increase of pollution. Acid deposition is now not only noted in the vicinity of Manchester, but affects large stretches of Asia, the Americas and Europe. Soil pollution has also become much more widespread. The atmospheric concentration of the greenhouse gas carbon dioxide has much increased, as can be seen in the next slide. This is bound to have substantial and long-lasting upward impacts on atmospheric temperature and sea level. Actually, with business as usual, it's likely that the place where I'm speaking, Amsterdam, will be sea by the year 3000. There's also a large impact on living nature. In the past, there have been five great extinctions. Best remembered is the great extinction of 66 million years ago, that marked the end to the terrestrial dinosaurs. Assuming business as usual, change in rarity of species suggests that we are now in the midst of the sixth great extinction. The growth of affluence, population and environmental burden has been given substantial sort in the 19th century and thereafter. The central issue to the 19th century economics was the stationary state, in which the economy and natural resources were in equilibrium. It was generally thought among economists that the stationary state was inevitable. Many economists, including David Ricardo and Karl Marx, hated that sort. Interestingly, a founding father of liberalism, John Stuart Mill, preferred the stationary state. In 1848, he wrote a book, Principles of Political Economy. In this book, he stated, I sincerely hope for the sake of posterity that we humans will be content to be stationary long before necessity compels us to it. Otherwise, the earth must lose a great proportion of its pleasantness for the mere purpose of enabling it to support a larger but not a better or happier population. He also sought that the stationary state would facilitate a moral growth, by which the existing type of social life, trampling, crushing, elbowing and treading on each other's heels, could be replaced. It's now more than 167 years since John Stuart Mill wrote his defense of the stationary state. But humankind has as yet not been content to be stationary, as evidenced by growth of cross-national product and the growing environmental burden. However, an equilibrium between mankind and its environment is still debated. It's now called the steady state economy. And technological optimists feel that changing the T factor in the IPAD equation may substantially help in moving in the direction of such an equilibrium.